Number 10, mummies. This should come as no surprise to anyone, but yeah, mummies. Well, not the first and not the last civilization to mummify their friends and family, ceasing to exist, they are probably most known for it. Well, that and maybe the pyramids. The pyramids are pretty cool, I guess. The process of mummifying or preserving the body was thought to be important for the soul during the afterlife. If the vessel or your body was not intact, then your soul could get lost. Therefore, if you want the pharaoh to live forever in the afterlife, then you must pickle and preserve the mighty king. I don't want my soul getting lost. Number 9. 40 Year Old's Worst Nightmare Despite my best efforts and anti-aging cream, there will come a time when I will be old. Personally, I'm not worried about putting some mileage on. That's life. However, something I am concerned about is the effects of aging. Have you ever just noticed that he ain't as limber as he used to be? You get tired easily. And if you have more than three beers, you have to lay down for three days. However, something that happens to a lot of men reaching their 40s is a little trouble in the bedroom. This was an issue in ancient Egypt, except sadly, there wasn't a messed up process to fix impotence. I know, right? That's crazy. You thought I was going to say something weird like wrap a snake around it or something. But no. When in modern times, the cute waitress at the golf clubhouse just doesn't get your blood pumping anymore, you could reach for a small blue pill that everybody knows. Egyptians did not possess such luxuries and instead prayed for the Pisha deal to work. Dear Desert Jeebus, please make my wiener work again. Thank you. Number 8. Ahead of their time. Ancient Egyptians just may have been ahead of their time and didn't know it. The Egyptians had tons of different herbs, plants, and methods for treating all kinds of ailments. Their alchemy skill was maxed out. I never did that. However, one method they came up with may have been helping more than they thought. A porridge mixture that was boiled down that contained tetracycline, which just in case you didn't know, is known as an antibiotic. This would have been very helpful for the time, as a scrape on the knee could be the difference between living and well, not living. While this was being used, it's unsure if the Egyptians really knew why this method worked. We doubt they understood the finite details of antibiotics, and I'm not going to stand here and pretend that I do either, because I don't. Number 7. Tales from the Crypt Keeper <laughs> You didn't think I was going to talk about mummies and not talk about how they make them, right? Hold on to your spittoons, this is going to be a rough one. Okay, so we all know that when we pass on, our bodies begin to decay and break down. The Egyptians knew this, so they would have to be one step ahead if they were to have the king pickled in time for the afterlife. Well, first things first, the brains? They gotta go. They would remove the brain with a large spike and sort of just sort of mash it up there and just well then they drain the contents from the nose, which that is just disgusting. Stomach, colon, and lungs, well, those won't be needed in the afterlife either, so they gotta go too. But the heart? The heart stays though. That's where the soul is. The king was then dried out with mounds of alkaline salt and the world's best beef jerky impression. Afterwards, oils were rubbed into the skin and eventually a resin was applied to aid in the linen wrap sticking to the body. Making for that distinct Tupperware brand airtight seal. The pickled king was wrapped numerous more times just to be safe and then, if he was OG enough, placed into a sarcophagus. And if you're really cool, you'll get your own room full of gold and treasures and your pet whiskers which is a cat, and be mummified because well, you need him in the afterlife too. That is one heck of an undertaking process. And to be fair, it kind of worked because there have been a few mummies recovered from Egypt and they're in amazing condition, considering the age of course. Number six, a little off the top. Okay, without the comment section oversharing here, some people have had circumcisions and some haven't. It's a part of life, okay? just. That's how it goes. Debatable to some, but it happens. This was a common practice in ancient Egypt, claimed to be for hygiene reasons. However, there's something a little bit different about their process. See, today it happens when you're a baby. A strange man comes in the room and he cuts what he has to cut. It's done, there it is. That's it, it's over. Egyptians waited a little longer, however, closer to the age of 12 or 13. Can you imagine just chilling in the field one day and then some strange dude grabs you and slaps you down on the table and makes a withdrawal from you to make you veg? I talked to the chief today and he just said that's that's not it. Don't don't do that. Number 5, bloodletting. The practice of bloodletting was common all over the world, but it may have gotten its start in ancient Egypt. It's a quite simple procedure, really. Black bile out of whack. Lose some blood. Can't stop coughing and sneezing? Drain some blood. Been possessed by demons and now they curse and haunt you as they run up and down your bloodstream? 
drain some blood. The question is, however, was this really helping? The short answer, no. No, it wasn't. Besides feeling lightheaded and going pale, this didn't really achieve much. Since the days of old were filled with all kinds of other ailments that would easily end someone's life before the spooky demons running up and down someone's bloodstream ever would. I don't feel good. Oh, we better bleed grandpa again. I don't know, like what? Number four, plastic surgery. Hey, there's nothing wrong with a little cosmetic surgery. I for one feel that if it'll make you feel better, go for it. Feel better about yourself, do it. I don't think there's any shame in that. It's been around for a long time, so long that ancient Egyptians might have come up with the first nose jobs. Obviously not like the ones today, but they were knowledgeable in surgeries. After all, you open the chest cavity of a dozen kings and you jot some stuff down on some papyrus, you learn a thing or two. More interesting than shaving down your own beak, however, was their implementation of the prosthesis limbs. Yes, all the way back then. One mummy was actually found with a fake toe. When tested in the modern day with period accurate sandals, it proved to work quite well and move more efficiently than first thought. Again, for the time, this was pretty advanced. Number three, the Ode of the Nile. Imagine people working all day in the blistering sands of Egypt, where the sun beams down on you like well, the sun in the desert, lifting massive rocks and carving them to shape. I don't know about you guys, but I would be sweating. And that also means I wouldn't be smelling too fresh, resembling that of a high school locker room. Yuck. Well, the Egyptians knew this was an issue, so they came up with what was probably the first underarm deodorant. Using nice herbs and other items that had pleasant aromas, and stuck them where the odor was coming from. In ya bits. I just know that after a long day of hard labor in the sun, I would need more than cinnamon sticks and lavender to tame the odor of my sweaty lumberjack armpits. That's just how it goes. Number two, the Egyptian Brazilian. The 70s have come and gone, and a popular trend today is to be hairless everywhere. Even in places where you didn't think it was possible to grow hair when you were younger. Egyptians took it upon themselves to remove all their hair. Well, at least most of it. Not because the Nile River had nice beaches, but because of lice. Oh, yuck. While not an exact cure for the itchy bugs that plague schools across America, it did seem to help. And if you've ever had lice before, you know how bad that sucks. I had them once, it was the worst. Cut my hair, shaved, shaved my head. Lots of baths, it's just, it's, it's no fun, man. Too cute for that, I don't want that. Number one, Wario breath, wow, okay. It makes sense that Egyptians would come up with breath mints and mouthwash. They fed their laborers diets of foods that contained a lot of onions and garlic. Sure, I'm just like everyone else who cooks, and when the recipe asks for one onion, eh, maybe I put in two. When I asked for two cloves of garlic, maybe I put in four. You gotta love that flavor. It was thought that they helped fight off disease, and. They were kind of right. However, after eating all that flavor, your breath would be something rancid. So herbs and mints were used to help quell the breath that could peel the paint off of walls. Thank God. Kicking off our list at number 10, dental surgery. Back in the ancient Egyptian world, it's not like you could just take a quick trip to the dentist to get your teeth checked out and cleaned, yada yada, and then you go home, whatever, right? The diet of the average Egyptian was most definitely not exactly, you know, conductive to having an impeccable set of pearly whites. That's mostly due to the fact that the tools used to grind food would often leave traces of sand and or stone behind, which, you know, would naturally destroy your chiclets. And through documents found, there have been a few different dental treatments from that time that have been discovered. And it's pretty horrifying, like topical treatments and such. But one case was able to give us a glimpse into what is believed to be the treatment of an abscess, an ancient abscess. We love those. Even more interesting is a mummy that was found from the fourth dynasty. This mummy, in his first molar, was a bunch of surgically produced holes that they believe were used to drain an abscess, which clearly gives us some, you know, very tangible evidence that dental surgeries were in fact happening all those years ago. And before we head into the rest of this list, we also have to remember that all this was done, or most of this was done, without anesthetics, right? No one's gonna put you to sleep, and then you wake up and you're like, oh, my teeth are gone, what happened? No, you were awake for the whole thing. It sucked. Number nine, Egyptian stitches. Yeah, gotta talk about Egyptians once again. I'm gonna talk about them quite a bit. They're the OGs. Just in general, while surgery did exist during ancient Egyptian times, invasive surgery wasn't quite as common because, well, obviously, like I just said, no painkillers, no antibiotics, the list goes on, right? No fun. One thing that's less invasive but still extremely important was seen quite a bit during these times. Use of stitches. Yeah, I've never needed any in my life, thank God, knock on... 
knock on wood that I don't need any stitches. Ancient Egyptians found different and effective ways to make their own sutures in order to close these large wounds. They did so by using plant fibers or hair or tendons or wool threads, anything, right? In the oldest known surgical text, which is referred to now as the Edwin Smith Papyrus that came from ancient Egypt, there are 48 different cases of stitches being described. 48, imagine being one of those 48, that's kinda epic, not gonna lie. Number eight, blood transfusion. Back around 70 AD, the Romans were pretty wild when it came to the Colosseum and the games that would go on inside. There was, uh, yeah, a lot of bloodshed and crowds would rush the arena after the day was done. Not to get autographs, but to hopefully, hopefully get a sip of that sweet gladiator blood. Yeah, blood back then was a magical elixir. And then near the early 1500s, blood was seen as this youth juice. Yeah, you drink some young blood as an elderly, and then those knees, your patellas, would apparently start working again. A lot of theories surrounding blood back then. And in the Middle Ages, bloodletting was a go-to when you were sick because they thought your humors were out of balance. It is so hot in this goddamn In 1628, blood circulation was discovered by a man named William Harvey. That changed the game, right? Now, the idea of something going into your bloodstream was in the picture hypothetically. That's a little odd. So we started to test this out on canines. Scientists were injecting them with different substances and slowly but surely that turned into blood transfusion between animals, between canines. So this is back in the 1660s, right? That's how early we started injecting things with blood. It's kind of gross. Number seven, cataract surgery. Okay, don't tell him I told you this, but Kyle, my brother Kyle, our other lovely co-host on B, is blind in one eye. Yep. Kyle was born with a cataract, but you would never know because he plays rugby amazingly and somehow he reads this tiny prompter. I can barely do it with two eyes. No idea how you do it, man, you're a champ. Cataract surgery is one of the oldest surgeries in the book, well, rather in the painting. It was found in a tomb in ancient Egypt. It was a painting of what is surely the oldest recorded eye surgery. Scientists are able to make this conclusion due to the length of the tool that the doctor is holding. They believed this was a method called couching, which happened to be recorded. See, the needle would push the cloudy lens to the bottom of the eye, ideally fixing their vision. The oldest tools found in Egypt tell us that 4,000 years ago, this was the first time it had been done. But afterwards, evidence of couching was found all over the world. Now, it wasn't until 1747 until Jacques Daniel, a doctor in France, he performed the first ever cataract extraction surgery in a modern sense. He was the OG. Every method sounds wildly uncomfortable. Have you been through this? Like Kyle has, kudos. Number six, skin treatment. As soon as summer comes around, honestly, it's game over. I burn so easily. That's why I'm a fan of winter, right? I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day and feel like I'm about to faint. But how did ancient Egyptians beat the heat back in ancient times? They didn't have banana breeze SPF 35. No, ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty. Yeah, you think your morning skin routine requires a lot of work? Buddy, read a book. Their routine was written on a tomb, written on tomb walls and scrolls. They used rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma arisenol. Yeah, that was used to block the sun off. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. Ancient Greeks would use olive oil as sunscreen, which as far as UV protection goes, it did absolutely nothing. You're burnt and dehydrated, but also you look good, okay? Tan lines, I see you. Number five, cancer treatment. All right, the big C. Cancer is something that obviously very is you know very prevalent in our modern society, and because of the rising rates, it makes us ask ourselves: Did cancer exist in ancient times? If so, where was it recorded? While they didn't call it cancer, it definitely did. Some of the earliest evidence of cancer is found in ancient manuscripts. Mummies, fossilized bone tumors that have been found in ancient Egypt specifically. There are tons of examples and different forms of cancer that have been found throughout. Perhaps the oldest comes from 3000 BC. And it was found, like I said, in the Edwin Smith Papyrus that we talked about before. Now in this text, it describes eight cases of tumors or ulcers of the breast and how they treated them back then, or at least tried to. See, back then these tumors were removed by cauterization using a tool called a fire drill. Other than this though, the text says in reference to the illness that there is no treatment. So in ancient times and today, we're still trying to figure this one out. Number four, tooth extraction. You may not think of surgery when you talk about tooth extraction, but this for sure counts as surgery. This, yeah, I've had a tooth pulled. It's pretty, it's pretty intense. Every time something gets removed from your body, I'm gonna count that. And if there's definitely blood involved, yeah, I'm gonna count that. Getting a tooth pulled is still so barbaric. Even today, they don't like slice a line and then gently slide the tooth out or anything surgical. No, they just have two dentists grab your tooth at the same time, put their foot up, and then yank it out. I was numb, sure, but it was still weird, okay? Back in the day, pulling teeth was done not to make room for braces, but to solve any problem, or well, all problems, regarding your teeth. Yeah, cavity, gone. Toothache, ugh, see ya. Oh, some plaque, no problem. 
Today, we're lucky to have x-rays and modern technology, you know, to tell us if a, a tooth is coming in sideways or which ways. But back then, some believed that it was tooth worms. Yeah, this feeling over here, could be a worm. Go get it checked out. Could have worms in your head. Gross. Aristotle and Hippocrates wrote about dentistry around 500 BC, and the way they would handle tooth decay or extraction was by using metal wires to fix wobbly teeth or even a broken jaw, aka ancient braces. Number three, trepanation. One of history's oldest surgeries. Trepanation was also, it was, it was the worst. It was horrible. To this day, we're not even sure why this was a thing, but we picked up a few ideas along the way. Let's talk about it. Turning the clocks back to thousands of years ago, trepanation was a practice of drilling holes into your skull. A popular theory is that trepanation was done to release evil spirits. Yeah, let's drill some holes in our skull and see if our mental illness just goes away. That'll help. As barbaric as this sounds, skulls found in Peru hint that this procedure wasn't as fatal as you'd first guess. The reason this would happen was also to clear out bone fragments after skull fractures, right? So you show up with a headache and leave with a, a hole in said head. But honestly, the fact that you're leaving at all is surprising, given the time. They didn't have any advanced medical instruments, but they did have sharp ones. This was the first surgical procedures around 6,500 BC. The term trepanation comes from the Greek term trepanon, borer. To, you know, to drill. Number two, rotting whale body. Okay, not all these are not disgusting. One of the most strange things on display at the Australian National Maritime Museum exhibit has got to be the whale carcass treatment. This is an odd treatment. Now the cure for rheumatism back in the 19th century was to crawl inside of a dead whale's body and uh, yeah, just hang out for a bit. And by a bit, I mean a full 30 hours. After that point, you would definitely be healed for at least 12 months. Yeah, it began in the town of Eden, obviously a whaling town on the southern coast of Australia. Only while this was happening, it was kind of funny, the user's head would be poking out of the whale. Yeah, like the world's worst sleeping bag, all tucked in there, getting better. It all started when an intoxicated man stumbled into a dead whale body, passed out, and then when he woke up, his rheumatism was cured, just like that. Yeah, from pale ales to pale whales. No more achy joints for you, my friend, let's do it. And finally, number one. Egyptian nose job. Plastic surgery is more widespread now than it ever has been before, but it's all because it started a long time ago, especially in the ages of the ancient Egyptians. In the Edwin Smith Papyrus, along with the documentation of trauma surgeries, bone fractures, fixes, and all that jazz, this text also shows examples of fixes for nasal injuries, which I gotta kinda seek. I have to seek some of that right now. I think I need to get my nose fixed. Can't breathe a lot. The treatment involved manipulating the nose into the desired position before using wooden splints or lint or swabs, anything really to hold it into place. You know, it's an ancient nose job. It's crazy, right? It's truly wild to think back about how much, you know, these people had shaped our world and lives, especially our medical world today. While so much of the civilization still remains a mystery to us, right? It's crazy how much we still know and how much we still don't know. At number 10, bloodletting. Back in the medieval age, medicine just wasn't the greatest. I mean, they had a plague that wiped out 50% of the population in Europe, and even their quote-unquote doctors were overlapping jobs. Barbers were cutting hair, obviously, but they were also setting broken bones and bandaging wounds, and I'm not sure I would really trust that. But back then, it was a case of you get what you get. So I guess people weren't complaining all that much about their barber Joey from down the street giving them a cast, you know? But other than the practice of patching wounds and whatnot, they were also practicing bloodletting back then, and it was a little much. Bloodletting was a practice of withdrawing blood in order to cure or prevent diseases or illnesses, so doctors would use things like leeches to suck blood out of their patients, but they also used scarification methods to scrape away the skin to drain the blood, and others used lancets to slice open veins, sometimes including the jugular vein. I'm so glad that we don't do this anymore because frankly, I would like my blood to stay inside of my body. Thank you. At number nine, the king's evil. Being a king or queen in the medieval ages might seem like a cool job, but I don't really think it was. With the rivalries that these people had, they were at risk of being assassinated in one way or another. They had to worry about their bloodlines and of course, that thing that everyone had to deal with, illness. Some kings, to help out their people, were tasked with healing an illness called the king's evil, and you're probably thinking, well, these kings aren't doctors, how did they cure illnesses? And to that I say, well, they touched it, of course. This whole thing started in the 11th century, when Edward the Confessor became known for touching a person that was suffering from scrofula, aka the king's evil, and curing them. 
People thought that this was a miracle, and so for hundreds of years after that, English and French monarchs were tasked with touching the sick to cure them of this illness because monarchs were believed to be an incarnation of the divine. Before we carry on talking about some of the bizarre medical practices from the medieval age, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. I never ate tooth worms. If you're one of those people who really hate going to the dentist, just be glad that you didn't have to go to the dentist during the medieval ages because that was an absolute nightmare and a half. Not only because they had no proper medicine or anesthetics, but because you could also get the worst diagnosis you could ever get, a diagnosis of an infection of toothworms. They believed that people could be infected with toothworms that caused a tooth decay and pits and holes in the tooth were home to a worm that looked like a tiny eel. What's worse than the diagnosis, however, was the removal process. They didn't want to pull out the tooth that was supposedly infected with these tiny worms, so instead they used a more holistic approach. A method that they would use to get rid of the worm would be to take a candle that was made of sheep's fat and various seeds, and they would hold it as close to the tooth as possible so that the worm would run out from heat and fall into a little dish of water that was being held beneath the person's mouth. That sounds like a horrible trip to the dentist, that's for sure. At number seven, pee readings. Now this might not be considered a surgery, but this medieval age tradition was probably one of the strangest medical practices I have ever heard. In medieval England, people were known to get diagnosed based on their pee. Back then, they believed that the consistency, color, and taste of someone's pee could diagnose someone's ailments. They took this method of diagnosis so seriously that they published books for the wealthy so that they could do this practice at home, and these books included illustrations and color charts so that they knew how to judge their own pee. According to their text, if your pee was white, then it was the ideal color, and that meant that everything was working just fine. If it was wine colored like blue or black, then that meant that something was very wrong. And if it was green, then you were basically on your last leg and you should probably get your will in order. Now, I'm not sure how accurate these readings actually were since medicine was basically non-existent back then, but they tried their best with what they had, I guess. However, I'm pretty sure you don't need a book to tell you that if your pee is wine colored, that's a bad thing. At number six, eye surgery. Our eyes are very sensitive, which is why it's so important to keep them healthy. Oftentimes when something is wrong with our eyes, we naturally go and get them fixed. But back in the medieval age, if something was wrong with your eyes, you really had to think long and hard about whether or not you really wanted to get them fixed because the procedure to fix your eyes sounded like an absolute nightmare. Back then when someone had cataracts, a surgical procedure called needling was performed and it involved having a doctor push a thick black needle into the patient's cornea. Remember, there was no anesthesia back then, so you were just raw-dogging this entire experience. After the procedure was completed, the patient would usually be left with an unfocused eye, described to be similar to a camera without a lens. That didn't necessarily matter to everyone, because while it would be hard to read the Bible, it would still be okay to plow a field, and as long as they could work, that's really all that mattered. At number five, kidney stones. Now, I can't say that I'm all that familiar with the way that kidney stones are treated these days, but I would assume that it is very different and not as terrifying as how they were treated back in the medieval age. After learning about this, I'm convinced that this could double as a form of torture. Basically, how it went down is a physician's assistant would be sitting on top of you while you had your legs strapped to your neck. And then as the assistant was holding you, the doctor would stick two of his fingies up your little booty hole, press his fist against your pubes until he felt a hard pellet indicating a stone. After the diagnosis, then it would be removed through the bladder using a sharp instrument. Now, I've never had a kidney stone, so I don't know how painful it is to have one, but for those who have experienced this, would you rather go through this medieval procedure or just tough it out until you pass the stone yourself? At number four, butt stuff. Even back in the medieval age, they had treatments for hemorrhoids. This illness was often associated with St. Fiaker, also referred to as the quote, patron of hemorrhoids. A 7th century tale said that this monk cured his illness by sitting on a sacred rock for several hours, and so in the medieval age, some physicians believed that the same method could apply to other people's butts. Obviously, that didn't work, so some other superstitious physicians came up with an alternate and more nightmare-inducing way of getting rid of hemorrhoids. If you didn't want to sit on a sacred rock for an extended period of time, you could always get a red-hot iron tube put up your butt. Yeah, I don't think it gets any worse than that. At number three, belladonna. Belladonna, deadly nightshade, whatever you want to call it, doesn't make it any less poisonous. 
This plant is one of the most toxic plants around, but that doesn't mean that people haven't tried to use it in their personal use. Normally, we want to stay away from toxic things like chemicals and X's, but back in the days of old, people said full scent and used belladonna as eye drops. Yeah, that's right. Even though this is literally poisonous, they thought, hmm, let's put it in our eyeballs. The organs that we use to see, because that's a bright idea, right? Many people, mostly women, used eye drops made out of deadly nightshade because it changed the size of their pupils to make them look more starry-eyed, and that was seen as a beauty trend. In moderation, these eye drops wouldn't really cause too much damage, but prolonged use of the poison could see some serious health concerns like stiff muscles, short-term memory loss, confusion, disorientation, and in some cases, death, because it could literally paralyze your heart. And if you're thinking, man, I'm so glad we don't do that anymore, then think again, baby, because if you've ever been to the optometrist and you've had your pupils dilated, guess what they use? That's right, belladonna. It's not harmful to put just a couple drops in your eyes and not to do it again for a while, but if you get your hands on it and start using it too much and in high dosage, then you're in for some trouble. At number two, trepanation. Trepanation is the process of drilling or scraping a hole into the human skull. Yeah, I know, that doesn't really sound like fun in the slightest, but back in the olden days, people did it, and it was a relatively common body modification for some reason. This practice was done in all sorts of cultures throughout different periods of time. During the medieval ages into the Renaissance, trepanation was used to treat epilepsy and mental disorders. This practice also dates as far back as the Paleolithic period. In ancient Peru, trepanation was done using a ceremonial knife called a tumi. In ancient Greece, it was done using a drill. Polynesians used sharpened seashells and in Europe, the procedure was done using sharp flint or obsidian. Though we know that in the medieval times and the Renaissance, trepanation was considered a medical practice, in ancient times, the reason for this practice is still uncertain. It could have been to try and fix damage from a head trauma, but it's also believed that this practice was done to heal mental problems, release toxic spirits, or even as some kind of ritual. And finally, at number one, knife hand. Now this one is by far the craziest medieval surgery in my opinion. So you know Captain Hook, right? got a hook for a hand? Well, this guy I'm gonna tell you about has Captain Hook beat by a landslide. A 6th century medieval burial was found in Italy and it revealed a male warrior who had a knife for a hand. Yeah, this man had a knife instead of a hand. This warrior had his hand amputated, however the reason for said amputation is unknown. In place of the lost hand, the prosthesis was a blade. Now I don't know if this guy lost his hand in battle or something and they just gave him the best that they could, and that was a knife as a placeholder, or if he just willingly chopped off his hand so that he could have a knife hand. But either way, that is so badass and I would have loved to see this guy in battle. Number 10, plastic surgery. Some celebrities you think are immortal when really it's just their plastic surgery that's fooling you. Unless you're Paul Rudd, he's definitely immortal. Sometimes it's obvious who's had it done and sometimes it's really obvious who's gotten it done. Coming from the Greek term plastikos, which means to mold or to form, the oldest known plastic surgery took place in ancient Egyptian days. There's a medical text from the ancient Egyptian days that was named after the American Egyptologist who got it in 1862 and in it contains these ancient procedures. They look a little bit different from the shows we see today. You know, where it's like all these medical, we're gonna take this thing and put it into this guy's head. And you're like, how did they do that? This was a lot different. This is ancient procedures we're talking about. What procedure back then was to fix nasal injuries? This method used wooden splints, lint, swabs, and the first ever nose job was done. Even in 2000, a mummy was found with a prosthetic toe. So they asked volunteers to try walking with it to determine if it was created for purpose or for style. That's, that's nice. Here, try on this mummy's toe. Take a lap, see how you feel. Are you cursed? Plastic surgery in the sense of reconstruction, that first account comes from India in the sixth century. The Indian physician Sashruta Shamita is considered the father of plastic surgery. His patients were more interested in the cosmetic side effects, whereas the Egyptian practices were to fix the nose. Now around 500 BC, reconstructive surgery was done in India as well to reform noses that were cut off as a punishment. Number nine, broken bones. Sometimes a bone breaks and it needs immediate medical attention. Maybe a bone is pushing into a vital organ, maybe it's healing the wrong way, or maybe it's just a toe and you can't do anything about it but hobble around the house all day and learn new curse words as you mumble them and hobble. We all had that one friend in school who always had a cast on or that blue finger restraint. There's always the one kid. But what happens if you broke your arm in the 1300s? Then what? Well, you wouldn't get any cool signatures from your cool friends, but what would happen is that they would use these blocks of wood and cloth and just wrap everything around completely tight. Just the biggest cast possible. You actually could sign your name on this thing as many times as you wanted. I take that back. This thing was, you pretty much had a coffin around your leg, more or less. 
Number eight, trepanation. One of history's oldest surgeries, trepanation was the worst, that's for sure. To this day, we're not even sure why this was a thing, but we picked up a few ideas along the way. Turning the clocks back thousands of years, trepanation was the practice of drilling holes into your skull. A popular theory here is that trepanation was done to release evil spirits. Yeah, let's just drill holes into our skull and see if our mental illness just goes away. As barbaric as this sounds, skulls found in Peru hint that this procedure wasn't as fatal as you would think. The reason that this would happen was also to clear out bone fragments after skull fractures. So you'd show up with a headache and then you'd leave with a hole in your head. But honestly, the fact that you're leaving at all is pretty surprising. They obviously didn't have advanced medical instruments. They would use any sharp instruments they could find, like rocks, flint. It was pretty rough. This was the first surgical procedure around 6,500 BC. The term trepanation comes from the Greek term trepanon, which means means a borer to, you know, to drill essentially. Number seven, tooth extraction. You may not think of surgery when you talk about tooth extractions or whatever, but this for sure counts as surgery. Every time something gets removed from your body and there's blood, I'm gonna count that, sorry. I had to get a tooth pulled a few years ago and I'm still haunted by it. It is so barbaric the way they do it. They don't slice a line and then gently slide the tooth out. No, they had two dentists just grab my tooth at the same time, put their foot up and then just yank my tooth out. Not, like that was, the, the, we're still there, really? Back in the day, pulling teeth was done not to make room for braces, but to solve any problem at all regarding your teeth. Cavity, gone. Toothache, see you later, tooth. Back in 5000 BC, a Sumerian paper referred to dental worms. So the earliest account of tooth decay, we think. Unless they were actual dental worms, in which case, gross. But no, it was, you had a cavity. We're lucky to have x-rays and modern technology tell us now if the tooth's coming in sideways. But back then, some believed it was always tooth worms, no matter what. If it hurts, eh, it's worms, get them out. Imagine pulling your tooth out and being like, didn't find any worms. Aristotle and Hippocrates wrote about dentistry in 500 BC, and the way that they would handle tooth decay or extraction was by using metal wires to fix wobbly teeth or even a broken jaw. So it was pretty horrible. If you go to the dentist now, just when you sit back and relax, you're sitting back and you're relaxing. That's it. The rest sucks, but these guys would stand up and just get yanked. Number six, blood transfusion. Back around 70 AD, the Romans were pretty wild when it came to the Colosseum and the games that would go down. There was lots of bloodshed, of course. There's animals and warriors and a lot of stabby stabbies. And crowds would rush the arena after the day was done, not to get autographs, but to hopefully get a sweet sip of that gladiator blood. Yeah, blood was considered a magical elixir back then. And then near the early 1500s, blood was then seen as youth juice. Yeah, if you drink some young blood as an elderly, those knees would just magically come back. Apparently, don't drink blood if you're watching this. Don't, unless you're Edward Cullen, don't drink blood. Team Jacob. Lots of theories surrounding blood in the Middle Ages. Bloodletting was a go-to when you were sick because they thought that your humors were out of balance. It was like, oh, you're sick? You just got some weird blood. We'll, we'll drain you out a bit. Vampires, all vampires. In 1628, blood circulation was discovered by a man named William Harvey, and that just absolutely changed the game. Now the idea of something going into your bloodstream was in the picture, hypothetically. So we started to test this out on canines, of course. Scientists were injecting them with different substances, and slowly but surely that turned into blood transfusion between canines. So this is back in the 1660s. That's how early we started injecting things. Number five. Mummification. Mummification was common. Even today we're finding more mummies. We're uncovering more ancient history. But how the hell was mummification done back then? How was it done so well? We're talking about teeth worms and trepanation. How did ancient Egyptians figure this out? And how is it done in a way where the bodies are still reserved this long? Well, it wasn't cheap, I'll tell you that for free. Being mummified was reserved for the rich. It's pretty brutal, but what you would do is basically, you get a hook in your nose and all your brains would be pulled out. And then they would cut the left side of your stomach, remove all those goods, all the organs, just bloop, gone, let those dry, yuck. And then you put the heart back in the body and then you wash the insides out with wine and spices over and over again until eventually you cover the body in salt for 70 days. And around day 40, you gotta stuff it with sand. Come day 70, that's when you can wrap them in those mummy bandages. Then the sarcophagus awaits you and so does the rest of your life. The jars of organs were also stored in the burial chamber with the sarcophagus. So it was just a big room of yuck. Number four, cataract surgery. My brother was born with a cataract. This one's for you, homie. Cataract surgery is one of the oldest surgeries in the book. Well, rather, in the painting. Found in a tomb in ancient Egypt was a painting of what is surely the oldest recorded eye surgery. Scientists are able to make this conclusion due to the length of the tool that the doctor is holding. A little metal rod going into their eye. Just doing this makes me cringe. 
They believed this was a method called couching. This happened to be recorded. The needle would push the cloudy lens to the bottom of the eye, ideally fixing their vision. The oldest tools found in Egypt tell us that 4,000 years ago, this was the first time that it had been done. But afterwards, evidence of couching was found all over the world. So they kind of were the OG couchers. It wasn't until 1747 until a doctor in France named Jacques Daviel, he performed the first cataract extraction surgery in a modern sense. Every method, older, ancient, modern, it all sounds wildly uncomfortable. If you've been through this, kudos to you. Hit that like button, glad your eyes and stuff are working. Number three, transplantation. Blood transfusion is one thing, but how the hell do we figure out transplants? This arm, now over there on that guy? Hmm? The first successful one was in 1954 in Boston at the Peter Benton Brigham Hospital. That was like a surgical procedure. The first successful one, by any means, came from around 1000 BC. An Indian surgeon, Samhita, had written down details on how to transplant tissue from one of the body areas to repair nose injuries. I mentioned that a little bit earlier. But later on in the 16th century, that idea was revised. In Renaissance Italy in the 16th century, a man named Gasparo Tagliacozzi, and finally, French surgeon Alexis Carroll changed the medical game again in 1902 they published their work on the new techniques using new studies on animals and blood vessels and to this day that technique is still used. In 1904 they partnered with Charles Guthrie in Chicago and performed the first successful animal transplant saving the dog's life. So not that long ago, weirdly enough, had to include it. Number two, open heart surgery. We've discussed ancient Egyptians and how they would clean out the entire body and put the heart back in. Now of course they weren't alive during any of this, that body is long gone. But when was the first open heart surgery? When did the impossible become a reality? Well, the first successful open heart surgery went down in Chicago in 1893. The patient was a man named James Cornish. He got a knife wound to the chest during a brawl. Now the surgeon, Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, who, by the way, used to be a shoemaker's assistant, saved this man. And the city's first interracial hospital too. Lots of firsts happening in this one. There we go. There weren't any textbooks on this type of operation at the time, so the odds of survival were low. In fact, there weren't any odds at all at this point. There were no x-rays, antibiotics, anesthesia, but also, there was no problem. Apparently, using just a scalpel, Dr. Williams cut through his chest, weaved through the nerves, muscles, ribs, everything important, until eventually he closed a severed artery near the heart. Cornish survived, and come 1894, Williams was promoted to chief surgeon at the Freedman's Hospital in Washington, DC. Coming at number one, stitches. I'm gonna totally jinx myself after this, but I've never broken a bone or gotten stitches in my life. I'm on a high alert now at all times. 27, not too bad. Many of my friends though, they've gotten stitches in their life. It's pretty common at this point. So I figured I'd cap this list off by going back to the origins of stitches. Going back to 3000 BC, once again, Egyptian literature, stitches were first made from plants, like hemp or cotton, or even animal tendons or animal arteries. Cat gut was the most common. That was thread made of sheep intestines. One of the craziest ways of closing a wound was by using ants, believe it or not. Leaf cutter ants or army ants, they would be held against the opening, and then you wait for it to bite down, and once it does so, you would then remove the body, cut the head off, so the head of the ant is still stuck biting onto your cut, staying there until it heals. Imagine Ant-Man showing up to save the day and he just throws a pocket full of army ants. He's like, I'm here, I'm here to save you all. He just shows up, whips all the ants. He's like, there you go, you're healed. They're like, we didn't expect this at all. Please send somebody else, Ant-Man. Psh, gross. Number 10, adhesive bras. Okay, we'll kick this list off with a sticky mess right off the hop. Back in 1949, Life Magazine released an article that caught everybody's attention, obviously. May 16th, 1948, the article read, for 5,000 years, clothes have been draped, tied, buttoned, pinned, and buckled on the human form. Now at this point, somebody walking by would go, oh, what's, what's this about? Then it continues. This year, for the first time in history, they will be glued on. Yes, what in the world, how? How is that possible? One newspaper, please, let's do it. Inventor Charles Langs, he changed the game in 1949. He made bra cups that would stick to you with adhesive. He was the OG who did this. Now, it didn't feel too good. Didn't quite work right off the bat, as most things do. The special glue, this adhesive, was promised to leave behind no residue. It was promised to be painless, yet at the same time, stay glued on, even if you were to jump into a pool from 10 feet high. That was the cell, yeah. Sounds kind of impossible, right? It was. Number nine, facial expressions experiment. Okay, here's a wild one. We're gonna get dark right off the bat, immediately changing up the vibe. The facial expressions experiment was no good. Back in 1924, a psychologist with the University of Minnesota, he wanted to conduct an experiment to study facial expressions, right? Sounds pretty harmless so far, dare I say, sounds a little bit silly. More specifically though, he wanted to see if everybody's expressions of emotions were the same. 
Does happiness look the same on everyone? Does sadness look the same? What about fear? What about shock? What about disgust or anger or even pain? Yeah, so he recruited some volunteers, didn't tell them all the details from campus, and then he painted the lines of their facial muscles black. He wanted to see how each muscle would move, even the slightest movements. He then exposed each participant to different stimuli in order to photograph their reactions, and then compare the results to everyone else which would look kind of creepy on a wall now that I'm talking about it. It gets worse when you find out what the stimuli actually contained. I guess this guy wanted big reactions because he included showing them adult films, he exposed them to ammonia, he made them touch reptiles and dangerous animals, and of course, he exposed them to horrible things that I can't even talk about here on YouTube. Yeah, you can only imagine back in the day what the he saw it was horrible. Yeah, horrible, right? That's a sad face. Big sad face in that one. For eight, the Detroit Ice Fountain. Located in Washington Boulevard, the Detroit Ice Fountain was obviously such a hazard. We can never do this again. This is horrible. You'll never see this. It was a spectacle, of course, but it was a hazard nonetheless. Back in the early 1900s, a fountain was the talk of the town during colder months. The water jets would run all year long for some reason. No one wanted to shut those off. They just let them go. So in turn, this fountain would freeze and pile up and then freeze and pile up and so on and Danforth. Now eventually it reached up to 60 feet tall, made of pure ice, right there on Washington Boulevard. It was a tourist attraction at that point. This was so dangerous. Yeah, shifting ice, dangling 60 feet above your loved one. What could go wrong? I can only imagine. Just tons of ice cracking all around you. Families would just gather around, it was horrible. The tradition has now moved to Belle Island so you can safely observe ice trees instead. A little bit nicer, yeah. Just not in the middle of the street anymore. Please, thank you. Number seven, spin doctors. Oh, this is amazing. Remember when you were a kid and you'd spin around with your friends and make yourself dizzy and be like, oh my God, it's great. Or I guess if you're just doing that now, it's cool too, sure. If you're a weird adult. It's all fun and games until somebody passes out or hits their head, right? That's why we don't do it often. Well, back in the mid 19th century, this was how medical experts would put you to sleep. Yeah, more specifically, this is how they used to treat schizophrenia and other mental illnesses. This is, they would just spin them and then see what happens. There was a whirling chair and a whirling bed, so you can pick your fate, I guess. A whirling bed, you ever lay down after a night out and you feel like your bed's spinning? It was that times a thousand, pretty much. They would spin these poor patients around until they blacked out, and the goal was to literally shuffle the contents of their brain around. That was their medical advice. Yeah, I'm glad we don't do that anymore. Imagine going into the hospital and being like, yeah, I got hit in hockey, my head kind of hurts a bit, I don't know. They're like, oh, no problem. Just get on the zipper here and just spin around for a hot minute. See how you feel. Number six, animal droppings. Hey, got a sore throat? No sweat, dog will fix that. Animal droppings being used in history for medicinal practice will always be hilarious. But it checks out, right? You have to look at the facts. Makes a lot more sense than spinning a guy until he's unconscious, that's for sure. Ancient Egyptian doctors, they would use donkey, gazelle, fly, and dog droppings to ward off bad spirits. Microflora was often found in these droppings, so the consensus was that these properties could include antibiotic substances as well. So poop was used for medicinal purposes as well in history. In 1957, a microbiologist, Stanley Falco, he began instructing folk to eat their own poop Ew. for medical reasons, which we here on Bumblebee actually disagree with. Don't do that. I'll tell you what you can do though, subscribe. That's much nicer, that has better results than eating your own. We don't want that. Number five, reindeer pet. Okay, Olivia and I are talking about a dog, but a reindeer? Maybe, I'll try and convince her. June 1941, the Germans were attacking the Soviet Union. It was one of the biggest attacks in history, and Britain and US had to send weapons, supplies, anything really, just to keep them afloat. Just to keep them in the fight, okay? So they sent these supplies through the Arctic Circle, which was the only route. But of course, it was littered with U-boats. Now thankfully, the British HMS Trident was there to watch the waters, and in turn, the Soviets were able to fight on. So as a gift, as a thank you, the Soviets sent the captain of said Trident, the World War II submarine, they sent them a live reindeer. Here you go, don't eat them, just enjoy them. Please, just enjoy the reindeer. The British had to accept, because of course it was ill-mannered if they didn't. So yeah, they had to keep a six foot tall, real life, alive reindeer on a submarine. That's, that's so stressful. She probably had a horrible time. Her name was Pollyanna and they brought her on board through a torpedo tube. That was her little commute onto the thing. She was a crew member for six weeks. Six weeks. 
Talk about smell, that's gonna, who pee you. Six weeks in there, get out of here. She slept better than most, believe it or not. She shared a room in the captain's quarters. Again, imagine the smell, I'm just saying. Number four, ice baths. We mentioned an ice fountain earlier, that was for sure a hazard, but let's talk about some old ice remedies. So if you saw somebody having an ice bath today, you wouldn't think anything of it, right? Maybe they just finished leg day and they're trying to reduce inflammation. Maybe they're trying to improve breathing. All that good stuff, you know? But back in the day, ice baths weren't just for athletes, right? They were meant for those who had rabies. Yeah, athletes and rabies, here you go, hop in. Rabies was of course a growing concern in Europe in the 1700s, so a treatment was to take 40 grains of ground liverwort, add some pepper, mix it up in milk, and then drink it, as well as having an ice bath. Both those things right there, there we go. Do that four times a day, and rabies should be gone. Historically, that's, it didn't happen, but that's what they wanted to happen. That's like a fear factor challenge. That's one of the worst things I've ever heard. Liver milk in a nice bath, horrible. Happy Sunday, I guess. Number three, tapeworms. Back in the Victorian times, they really figured out the trick to weight loss. Nice. Was it watching what you eat, counting your steps, maybe getting a gym membership at ye old gym? No, no, it was way easier than all those combined. And you didn't even have to pull back on what you ate. How great is that? All you needed was a handy tapeworm. Yeah, a little, a little tapeworm inside you all the time. You know those things that can kill you if you get one today? Yeah, that was their plan back in the Victorian days. The plan was, if you eat a tapeworm egg, it will later hatch in your stomach, and at that point, you could just eat anything you wanted. Because every time you ate the tapeworm, he would also eat. So you could get your snack on while still rocking those Victorian skinny jeans, know what I'm saying? Tapeworm cyst pills or the Stairmaster? I don't know, take your bets. He's like, I'm hungry. Number two, smoking solutions. All right, don't smoke, don't do that. Here at Bumblebee, we say don't smoke. Back in 1665, during a plague in London, you were told to smoke cigarettes because they were considered disinfectants. This is wrong, this is again, don't smoke. Yeah, sore throat, no problem. I'm sure this pack of darts will help. Here you go. We mentioned before tobacco smoke enemas, which is hilarious, but this is just bad advice all around. Since mouth to mouth wasn't a thing until the 50s, if you were trying to save a drowning victim, you would ideally blow smoke in their face or their butts. Either way, don't do it, it's insane. And then cut to 1964, it turns out smoking is bad for us. Yeah, what? Ah, oh, who knew, who would have thought? Yeah, it's pretty intense now. The photos on cigarette packages, they're haunting to look at. Number one, ants, man. Okay, I'm totally gonna jinx myself for this, but I've never broken a bone or gotten stitches in my life. Knock on wood, knock on wood. Chris, have you? Um, Bones or stitches? Yeah, stitches. Bone yes, stitches no, okay. Comment down below. Bone yes, stitches no. That's gonna be a weird comment section, but I'm here for it. Many of my friends have gotten stitches in their life. It's obviously pretty common. So I figured I'd cap this list off going back to the origins of stitches because it sounds very painful and it's impressive. Going back to 3000 BC, once again, Egyptian literature, this is where you could find this. Stitches were first made from plants like hemp or cotton or animal tendons, animal arteries, you name it. Cat gut was common. That was thread made out of sheep intestines. That's a fun one to get right there. That's probably smelly. One of the craziest ways, though, of closing a wound was by using ants, real life ants, believe it or not. Leaf cutter ants, or army ants, they would be held against the opening of your wound, and you'd wait down for it to bite. Now, once the ant bit, you would cut its head off so that the head of the ant was still stuck biting onto your wound, staying there ideally until the wound heals up. Yeah, imagine Ant-Man shows up to save the day and he just shows a pocket full of army ants. Not what I expected at all, but still helps me. Thank you so much, Ant-Man, you're the best. Please send somebody else next time. Awesome, this is so itchy. At number 10, dental modification. When thinking about types of body modification, you might not always think of dental work falling under that category, because really, who just thinks about teeth on a daily basis other than dentists, right? No one is really thinking too hard about those bones in our mouths, but dental modification is a thing and has been for many, many years. Though nowadays we see modifications with braces, tooth gems, and the occasional grill, back in ancient times, people were also modifying and decorating their pearly whites. For example, in the 7th century BC, Etruscan women would wear flat gold bands around their teeth as a way to both decorate and keep them in place. In Mesoamerica, some people would file their teeth using stone tools to carve their teeth into different shapes. They would also drill holes into their teeth and insert small stones and minerals like jade and iron pyrite into them. 
Vikings were also known to modify their teeth by carving horizontal grooves into them and sometimes filling the grooves with red dye as a way to make them look more fearsome. As if they needed to, right? I mean, they were Vikings. They were fearsome enough as it is. Though many of these practices have since been discontinued, so to speak, there are still people out there who we know would definitely try some of these ancient practices out. At number 9, foot binding. Foot binding was a body modification practice in China that began in the 10th century AD. This whole trend started because a court dancer bound her feet and the emperor at the time, Emperor Li Yu, liked what he saw. Soon this practice of foot binding became a huge trend and it became associated with being able to find a husband. The practice of foot binding began when a girl was 5 or 6 years old. They would have her feet be in hot water, have her nails cut short, and have their skin rubbed with oil before having their 4 smallest toes broken, folded over, and tied down. Then their feet would be bent in the middle to break the arch, and the girl would have to walk around like that over time crushing the heel and sole of the foot. After about 2 years, the foot would be considered ready, and depending on the size of the girl's foot by the end, this would judge how easily she would be able to be matched with a good husband. This practice continued all the way until the 20th century. Now before I carry on telling you guys about weird ways people modified their bodies, let me first ask you to leave a like on this video if you're liking what you see so far, and also maybe consider subscribing while you're at it, so come join the Bumblebee family. At number 8, Scarification. Scarification is the practice of cutting, burning, or slicing the skin to create raised scars that are seen as decorations on the body. The practice of scarification dates back quite a while with the earliest evidence of this body modification dating back to 8000 BCE, where figurines of fertility goddesses were found with the appearance of scars along their bodies. Scarification could date back even further than that, but since skin is very rarely preserved, we may never know. Evidence of scarification have been found in cultures in Africa as well as Australia, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, North, South, and Central America. Depending on the specific culture, there were a number of reasons behind the presence of scarification in their culture. Some people did it to show status or wealth, others did it for cosmetic purposes, others did it as a rite of passage, and some did it to show how well they could handle pain. In many cultures, scarification is still present, and honestly, I think it's pretty beautiful. At number 7, trepanation. Trepanation is the process of drilling or scraping a hole into the human skull. Yeah, I know, it doesn't sound fun in the slightest, but back in the olden days, people did it, and it was a relatively common body modification for some reason. This practice was done in all sorts of cultures throughout different periods of time. During the Renaissance, trepanation was used to treat epilepsy and mental disorders, and this practice also dates as far back as the Paleolithic period. In ancient Peru, trepanation was done by using a ceremonial knife called a tumi. In ancient Greece, it was done using a drill. Polynesians used sharpened seashells, and in Europe, the procedure was done by using sharp flint or obsidian. Though we know that in the Renaissance, trepanation was considered a medical practice, in ancient times, the reason for this practice is still uncertain. It could have been used to try and fix damage from head trauma, but it's also believed that this practice was done to heal mental problems, release toxic spirits, or even as some kind of ritual. At number 6, Neck Stretching In many cultures around the world, having a long neck is considered beautiful, and so many women practice neck stretching in order to attain this level of beauty. The practice of neck stretching is most commonly done by wearing metal rings around the neck, adding more and more rings over time. This practice was first seen in the 11th century in Southeast Asia. The theory behind the rings is that they're so thick that they push the head up, therefore stretching the neck, but in actuality, the lengthening of the neck is caused by the rings pushing down on the collarbones. The origin of this practice is unknown, but it is theorized that it began as a way of making women look more attractive in order to prevent getting captured as slaves. But on the other hand, some believe that this was a way of protecting people from getting attacked by tigers. Though this practice began so long ago, it is still a traditional body modification in some parts of the world. At number 5, Self Mummification The process of self mummification is probably one of the most intense practices of body modification out there, not only because the process is so lengthy, but it also involves passing away at the end of it all. Self mummification is done by people who practice Shingon Buddhism and is believed to be a way of ascending to a higher spirit spiritual power and gaining immortality. The process of self mummification is done over the course of 3,000 days. It involves a very strict dietary change, eliminating all cereals, and instead being restricted to eating only nuts, tree bark, resin, pine needles, and berries. This diet reduces fat and moisture in the body to avoid bacteria breaking down the body after death. 
Some people who practice self mummification also drink a tea that is made out of urushi, which makes the person throw up, but also acts as a kind of embalming fluid. Once a person's body is fully prepared, they are buried alive in a small chamber with an air hole, and they would chant and ring a bell to let people know that they're still alive. Once the bell stops ringing, the chamber is fully sealed, and three years later, they're dug up and examined to see if they've been successfully mummified. If they have been, then their body is put on display and worshipped, and if the process was unsuccessful, then they're given an exorcism and reburied. And number four, tattoos. As we all know, tattoos are still a very prominent part of our culture to this day. But this body modification also has a long history dating as far back as 3300 BCE. The earliest evidence of tattoos comes from Otzi the Iceman, a natural mummy who was found in the Alps who lived thousands of years ago and had a series of small dots and crosses tattooed along his lower spine, knee joints, and ankle joints. Researchers believe that this individual got these tattoos for medicinal reasons to relieve joint pain. In later years, tattoos were seen on more people showing more intricate designs with different meanings. In ancient Peru, the process of tattooing was done by using cactus spines, dipping them into charcoal and pressing it into the skin. Even some Egyptian mummies showed evidence of tattoos on their bodies. So next time you ask your mom if you can have a tattoo and she says no, tell her about the history of this practice and maybe she'll reconsider. Maybe. At number three, piercings. Much like tattoos, piercings are still very common in society. I mean, I have a few of them myself. They're in my face. Yeah. But again, much like tattoos, piercings also have a rich history to them. Otzi the Iceman, who I just mentioned, was not only found with tattoos, but he also had piercings as well. He's starting to sound a little too much like my Tinder matches, honestly. Otzi had pierced ears, which tells us that this body modification is just as old as tattoos. In the past, piercings were also seen amongst all make men in Mesoamerica, and they had plugs put into their cheeks, expanding them as it got bigger. Aztec men also had piercings sporting lip, nose, and ear plugs, but in this society, your social status dictated what your piercings could be made from. The nobility wore piercings made from gold and precious stones, while lower classes of people had to wear bone. Victories in warfare also influenced someone's piercings, as they would be awarded bigger and bigger lip rings with every success. Even ancient Egyptians wore piercings. King Tut was found to have piercings, however, belly button piercings were very exclusive and were reserved for the pharaoh and anyone else who had one would be executed. At number two, head shaping. The process of head shaping caused people in modern times to think that aliens were real. When remains were discovered with oddly shaped skulls, people really thought that we had proven the existence of extraterrestrials, but in reality, it actually led to the discovery of an entire practice of human body modification. The process of head shaping involves putting some kind of pressure on a baby's head so that it grows into a different shape. This has been done using cloth or even boards in order to create the desired shape. The earliest evidence of modified skulls comes from Australia and dates back between 14,000 and 9,000 years ago. The skulls that were found had flattened foreheads and very prominent brow ridges. This practice also occurred in South America where skulls with a variety of different shapes were also found. There were a number of different reasons for head shaping among different cultures. Some did it for aesthetics, others did it to protect spirits, but either way, it made for some very interesting looking people. And finally, at number one, knife hand. Now this one is by far the craziest one in my opinion. So you know Captain Hook, right? got a hook for a hand? Well, this guy I'm gonna tell you about has Captain Hook beat by a landslide. A 6th century medieval burial was found in Italy and it revealed a male warrior who had a knife for a hand. Yes, this man had a knife instead of a hand. This warrior had a hand amputation, however the reason for said amputation is unknown. In place of the lost hand, the prosthesis was a blade. Now I don't know if this guy lost his hand in battle or something, and the best that they could do was give him a knife as a placeholder, or if he willingly chopped off his hand so that he could have that knife hand, but either way, that is so bad and I would have loved to see this guy in battle. Kicking off our list at number 10, ancient Egyptian eyeliner. Whenever you see hieroglyphics or any art depicting the great pharaohs, they're usually rocking some some impressive eyeliner. They look great, right? Like a 90s pop star, they look awesome. Ancient Egyptians were the OG eyeliner users. They made their own eyeliner from lead salts. And no, before you think about getting creative, do not try this at home. This wasn't an ideal process. See, for starters, these salts were quite high in lead concentration. So in order to avoid that mess, ancient Egyptians first had to process and then filter that lead salt for up to 30 days in order to get the lead levels low enough to even be applied. So you had to plan accordingly. Like, oh, I have a pharaoh date in 30 days. Perfect. We'll start now. It was a hazard if done incorrectly. Not only was this ancient beauty practice, well, beautiful to look at, but Egyptians also needed eyeliner to protect against sun damage as well as fight off any infections. Yeah, we don't encourage rubbing lead on your eyes today. We have a few different methods on, you know, how to look good. 
I think. None of them include lead, hopefully, ideally. Number nine, hair gel. Back in my day, in high school, I had to use Dippity Do Extra Hold Hair Gel. Yeah, I showed a scale on the side, I always got the five out of six hold, that was good. Six was too much, nobody ever did the full six, that's crazy talk. But in ancient Egypt, we didn't have styling, spiking glue, and blasting free spray by DJ Pauly D. No, we have that today, unfortunately, but back then, a little different. Back then, ancient Egyptians loved styling their hair, but again, before DJ Pauly D was born, what is a pharaoh to do? If the Great Pyramids are any indication, they knew something that we didn't. Ancient Egyptians knew how to keep their hair in one place all day long. And that heat too, how do you do it? My curls? I'm jealous. Their hair styling gel was made with shea butter and coconut oil. But more often than not, they would replace coconut oil with almond oil. So this was a completely natural and strengthening styling gel. Gosh, so today we have whatever that is. Psst, ice spray, that's awesome. DJ Polly. psst, no. Number eight coffee scrub. I love coffee. I don't think I love coffee enough to do a coffee face scrub, but hey, never say never. I'll try anything once. Ancient Egyptians would use coffee scrub to reduce inflammation, improve blood circulation, and since it's a ground up material, it's gonna remove those dead skin cells at the same time. Next holiday season, grab your aunt some coffee scrub. Just tell her how it reduces puffiness, improves the skin's texture, all that good stuff. It'll give you that youthful feral look that you've been going for, you know what I mean? Merry Christmas, here you go, coffee on your face. Using grounded coffee powder to explore Exfoliate your skin sounds like a new idea. It's certainly a hot trend today. But before TikTok, ancient Egyptians already knew these benefits. Damn, I'm gonna get a coffee scrub. Maybe I'll do it, I don't know. After I'm done this cup, I'll just rub it on my face, on my desk, and see what uh, everyone says. Number seven, dead sea salt. You'll never feel more alive than when you use dead sea salt. Here we go. Ancient Egyptians were ahead of the exfoliation game. Dare I say, they invented it. Not only were coffee scrubs a necessity, but salt from the Dead Sea was one of the most popular ancient Egyptian skincare products ever. We traveled far and wide for this one. Salt collected from the Dead Sea was used to exfoliate dead skin cells, and it was so well known at this point that, rumor has it, Cleopatra herself would travel all the way to the Dead Sea from Egypt just to take a bath. Yeah, let's be honest, after this point, we'd all love a rejuvenating Dead Sea float. That sounds way better than what I've got at home. Well, bath, probably can't even fit in this thing. Dead Sea sounds way better. I once left a house party earlier to go have a bath. Sort of God, York University. Dipped at like 10 o'clock. I was like, I'm cold. I'm not doing this. 40 minute walk, worth it. Leave your friends for a bath. Do it. Number six, wax cones. Head cones, also known as perfume cones, were used in ancient Egypt. You've probably seen them in a thumbnail here at some point. The art depicting head cones is quite unique looking. It's like a pharaoh with a triangle on their head. You're like, what's happening there? What is this? Is this like Illuminati? What is this? Long before Pantene Pro-V, when it came to head cleanliness, these triangular wax cones were here to save the day. And they looked pretty fun to use. I don't know. They would just sit on top of your head. You didn't need to mix anything with lead for 30 days or bran or anything like that. You didn't need to put any organs in jars, just a wax cone atop of your head. Easy. Back in 2019, experts found archaeological evidence that they were in fact used. So yeah, not just a glyph real life history. So I have to bring this up. Men and women alike would wear this cone and your body heat would slowly melt the wax cone down and through your hair. The cone itself was made of oils, fat, resin. It would be placed on their wig or directly onto your head and it would keep melting and refreshing all day long. It's like a little candle almost. A nice little human candle. A nice little Egyptian man candle. As fascinating as ancient Egyptian culture is, I don't think anybody misses wax cones. It's a little easier nowadays. I'm too tall too. I can't have a wax cone. Are you kidding me? It would hit this mic. No way. Number five, fake beards. I can't grow a beard, so maybe I'll just start rocking the, the fake one, you know, like Hatshepsut. Long before Cleopatra, Hatshepsut was the first woman to obtain power as a pharaoh. She was the sixth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. There were just a few that were women in total, but during her reign back in the mid 1400s BC, following the death of Thutmose II, she was determined on being portrayed as a male. The pharaoh, fake beard, the massive muscles, historians believe that this was all done as an act of politics. After her passing, come 1458 BC, her stepson took the throne, Thutmose the third, and he destroyed everything in her name and image. Well, mostly everything. Now we have this bearded pharaoh that we're pretty sure we figured out. Number four, acne. Ancient Egyptians came up with a, an interesting method on getting rid of those pimples, that's for sure. Remind you, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing, so. Again, creative. Physicians back then discussed pimples as these elevated spots with black tops that can plague your skin from four to five years. And by squeezing these spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were called maggots back then. Imagine your partner, hey, can you get this pimple on my back? Yeah, I think I got some maggots in there. I don't know. I'd be sick. See ya, now we're single. They would refer to severe cases of acne as maggots that lie in a bed of roses. Hey, if a physician ever told me I had maggots that lie in a bed of roses on my persons, I would faint. That's the scariest news 
news I've ever heard in my life. That's some bad news, man. Dermatological disorders were thought to be human skin taken on the properties of animals. Yeah, oh, you have acne? Hmm, are you sure you're not turning into a bird? Maybe it's that, come back next week. Ancient Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds, all to get rid of acne, hopefully. Sorry, maggots, not acne, maggots. All to get rid of maggots. I'm gonna go throw up. Number three, prosthetics. The ancient Egyptians were a culture of firsts and some of their achievements we still have no idea how they were able to accomplish. Like the pyramids, I couldn't tell you, could you? Didn't think so, hit that thumbs up. We're both wrong, we're both learning. It's very likely that some of the first ever prosthetics were used in ancient Egypt. How fascinating. Imagine being the first guy to make a toe, a fake toe. A female mummy who was discovered near Luxor had her death dated somewhere between 950 and 710 BCE. And she was also found with a prosthetic toe made from wood and leather on her person. While this of course is a wonderful cosmetic replacement and it's no secret that the ancient Egyptians certainly valued aesthetics, it seems as though this prosthetic toe was completely functional and was actually used to help this woman walk. The toe, after it was discovered, had significant signs of wear and tear, which then inspired experts to start a study, look a little further, and they did. So they took participants and tested their gait, both with and without the use of a replicated toe, and in ancient Egypt, the common footwear were sandals, and walking in them would've been uh, next to impossible without a big toe. So it's clear that this prosthetic was very helpful and important to those similar to this Luxor mummy. Not exactly a beauty practice, but I'm sure they also felt a little more confident with that toe. This is also too impressive to exclude. Beauty list, I'm like, yeah, toes are beautiful, why not? Throw them on. Number two, henna. I got henna done a few years ago and I totally blanked. I forgot that it lasted longer than like two days. I was like, day four, I'm like, what's going on, man? Is this permanent? While on one hand, pun intended, it is beautiful, ancient Egyptians' use of henna went beyond style and beyond imaging oneself after the gods. See, henna also has cooling effects on the body, and ancient Egypt was, uh, was quite hot. It was used by ancient Egyptians to color their hair and fingernails in shades of red and orange. Now this shade, this exact shade, also provided comfort on hot days. Come back with some henna, that's kinda nice. It lasts longer than a few days though, just so you know, if you wanna get henna, it's important to know. That guy did not tell me in Greece. No, he did not. And finally, number one, deodorant. When it comes to deodorant, today we listen to the old Spice guy. He's always whistling about something new. But long before he was born, ancient Egyptians used ostrich eggs for deodorant. They made perfumes and oils, this is commonly known, but they were also the first to use any type of deodorant, like underarm deodorant, it was so impressive. Ostrich eggs mixed with a little fat and tamarisk and tortoise shell and then nuts, mix them all together and bam, there you go, you're ready for date night. Just apply all of that on your body. Another method was a little more yummy than ostrich eggs and nuts. See, Egyptians would also use porridge balls. How creative is that? Flavored porridge rolled up and safely tucked in. And your underarm right there, right there on your little smelly chicken wing. This morning I had some deodorant just crumble apart when I was applying it. You ever have that happen? Turns to feta cheese all of a sudden, mid-application. Now my bathroom sink looks like a Greek salad. It smells great, but not practical. Might have to go back to the porridge ball method. Who knows? Maybe I have one right now. Maybe that's why I haven't moved this arm the whole time. Who knows? Number 10, suck on a clove. Bad oral hygiene was not permitted back in ancient China. Bad breath, even less so. For example, if you were going to be seeing the emperor, it was required that you suck on a clove beforehand to make your breath all nice and fresh, just in case. I think I'm going to use that as an insult. I'm not going to say it again because I feel like, no. Yes, I like this. Other than breath fresheners, the ancient Chinese used primitive toothbrushes made of willow branches that were rinsed clean and then chewed to make all hairy and stuff. And then dipped in some of this tooth cleaning powder made of a bunch of different ingredients like pork teeth, saponin, ginger, cooked remina glutinosa, mulu, eclipta, lotus leaf, green salt, and other things I don't want to struggle to pronounce. Okay. Before that though, they would also use salty warm water as a mouthwash, which would make their teeth more firm and help clean them. I actually do this uh, like every once in a while after I brush my teeth too. It's actually really good for your gums. These ancient Chinese knew what was up. Number nine, bathing. In ancient China, the etiquette of a gentleman demanded that he wash his hands five times a day, take a bath every fifth day, and wash his hair every third day. Bathing every day was a bit of a superstitious no-no, started by northern Chinese societies that would actively avoid cold water or bathing in the winter to avoid getting a cold altogether. And not bathing at all was considered barbaric, like those pesky Mongols who hated bathing and who were hated by the Chinese. Honestly, that part is, is kind of fair. They, they, they kind of sucked. So yeah, 
to kind of reach a nice midpoint. The norm was to wash once every five days. But that was for the nobility. The common people had access to giant bathhouses where they would go, and I mean, they could go whenever they wanted, really. I shower every morning. I have heard that's bad, but I don't think I'd willingly go for like five days without washing, so I don't know. Maybe I gotta move it to every other day. I, somebody give me advice, please. Let's move on, I, let's just move on. Number eight, rice water. So, the Chinese washed like once a week. That's fine, but how did they wash? What did they use? Well, in the beginning, it was actually common to bathe using rice water as your go-to. It would be used as both body wash and shampoo. The rice water was really good at removing oil and keeping that hair and scalp nice and beautiful, as well as keeping skin nice and silky smooth. The rice water also contains starch, protein, and vitamins that are really good for us. It helped with lower back pain, frostbite, and it was really good to help relieve some of the exhaustion after a long day. Most baths are good at that, honestly. The Chinese also used honey locust that was really good for eliminating dirt and treating rheumatism and ringworm. Both rice water and honey locust were used for doing laundry as well, with honey locust keeping clothes unfaded and in good condition. As far as ancient cultures go, the Chinese are already far ahead and we're only on the eighth point. Number seven, threading. Bet you didn't know that hair was not really people's favorite thing in ancient China. I saw somewhere that they even referred to it as thread-like things of troubles. Why the hate? I don't know, but it was part of the reason monks would completely get rid of it. Other people would remove their hair too, and one way of doing that was the practice of threading. A form of hair removal that is still a thing we do today, actually. Now, I apologize if I messed this up, I've never had it done, but threading basically consists of a thin cotton or polyester thread that is doubled, then twisted, and then it's rolled over areas of unwanted hair, plucking the hair at the follicle level. In our modern day and age, it's typically used for eyebrows to shape them and keep them gorgeous. In ancient China, they would use threading to deal with facial hair, which, I mean, I guess eyebrows kind of count as facial hair, so. Threading isn't really opportune for arm or leg hair, though, so it's just a pure facial thing. Good to know. Number six, combs. Yeah, some people didn't like hair, but those who deal with it made sure to keep that stuff nice and combed. Combs were all the rage. A province of China even got the nickname of the home of combs, which is a great name. Whether they would be made of wood, stone, or animal bone, many combs were made with care and craftsmanship. Comb shops would open up all over the show and people would carry combs as accessories. And they'd come in all sizes. Get yourself a comb for the weekends, a large comb to get all your hair at once, a comb to hold your hair in place. Heck, get a comb to help weed out those pesky lice. Number five, lice. Yes, while we're talking about hair care, why not touch on the subject of lice? It's a problem everywhere, not just in your elementary school. Ancient China had lice problems just like ancient Egypt did. While almost everyone chose the path of baldness in Egypt, it was not so in China. No, other than honey locusts and rice water to clean your hair, one of the common practices to deal with lice was to, um, well, it was to eat the lice that you picked out of your hair. Hey, grub is grub, but I think, uh, I think I'd like to move on from this topic now. Let's, let's go, let's go, let's get the heck out. Number four, poo poo stick. I'm sorry that we have to talk about this, but actually, you know what, I'm not that sorry. Just as it does now, going to drop the kids off at the pool in ancient China left you with the task of cleaning yourself up afterwards. Wiping your bottom, that's what I'm talking about. Now, they did have paper back in ancient China, like we talked about in our ancient Chinese inventions video, but paper was expensive and the only ones who really used it were the emperor and royalty like him who would use straw paper. Before that, and for everyone else, people would use a stick-like tool called a chugi, I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong, which was basically bamboo strips that were shaped to be thin and flat and slightly wide with rounded edges. Some of these even had great water absorption and a lovely scent. Those who were a bit more fortunate would then wash with water, kind of like an ancient bidet, and then use some good smelling stuff to make it all better. Other than that, a lot of people were cool with using leaves or sticks and stones, and honestly, whatever could do the trick, really. I mean, when you gotta go, you gotta go. Number three, using dirt to clean? Okay, okay, not dirt, but soil. Ancient cultures, including the ancient Chinese, would use soil as a tool in cleaning, which actually had the benefit of being able to help remove oil stains. Now, how did this happen? Apparently, it is believed to be caused by the alkaline qualities of the soil that really helps with the removal of oil. 
soil and oil. I did not like that. Which the Chinese actually seem to figure out how to specifically utilize. The Chinese used a kind of natural alkali to clean their clothes, which evolved to be scented to help keep the clothes nice and funky smelling. The use of this stuff was so popular that there were tons of scented alkali stores that opened up around China, with some even becoming pretty famous. Maybe not unusual, but definitely very interesting and a precursor to modern laundry soaps. So, hmm. Number two, water purification. Well, this may be considered more of a health thing than a hygiene thing. I mean, I'd argue that hygiene is health, so get at me. <laughs> the ancient Chinese discovered and made extensive use of groundwater for drinking, and they kept record of how they would keep their wells and well water nice and clean. The construction of the wells was pretty important, with the bottom of the wells regularly being dredged to keep the water clean. The inner walls of the wells were reinforced with ceramic bricks and tiles to stop that pesky soil and other impurities from falling into the water, and the openings of the wells were covered to safeguard against contamination from above the ground. The cleaning of wells was even institutionalized as a feast in some places. So cleaner water and food, it's a win-win. Knowing early on that drinking water could make them pretty sick, the Chinese boiled their water and allowed the sediment to settle before using it for cooking and drinking. They also knew what was up with water. They just knew what was up in general. It's pretty great. Okay, let's move on. I'm talking too much. Number one, no stink. Smelling funky fresh and clean was all the rage, as it should be today too. I ain't trying to be on the subway with a nose full of body odor, just as I wouldn't wish to submit anyone else to that. Th to be fair, not everyone knows they stanky and some people don't get a choice, but back in ancient China, those who were wealthy enough would spice up their weekly baths with roots, flowers, peppers, ginger, and all that yummy smelling goodness to basically create a lovely smelling cleansing soup to plop themselves into. Women would also carry around aromatic pouches that would just keep a nice smell around them at all times. Those who were not as wealthy would have to find other means to keep things fresh though. One that I'm not too sure would actually help smell wise was applying their own pee pee to their pits once a year on New Year's. This was done as a kind of a disinfectant. Number 10, no lice. You know in elementary school when they would check everyone for lice and one poor sucker had to get their head shaved and walk around as that bald kid for like a month and would probably get bullied? Well that ain't gonna happen back in ancient Egypt because everyone shaved their heads to avoid lice back then and priests would shave their whole bodies just like Michael Phelps. Instead of having actual hair of their own, they would wear wigs. Wigs sometimes made of human hair. That honestly was a lot better in that harsh desert sun. Lice and other little pests like that, like fleas, were not wanted. And yeah, they still aren't. But it led to some honestly interesting solutions. For example, a warm potion of date meal and water was believed to drive away fleas and lice. They would use cat's fat to keep away mice, I made a rhyme, and one that probably actually did something was when they used a solution of natron water and salt in their humble abodes to eliminate and repel fleas. Number nine, ancient sunscreen. As soon as summer comes around, game over. I burn so easily. That's why I'm a fan of winter. I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day, all night, and feel like I'm about to faint, obviously. Canada gets quite hot. But how did Egyptians beat the heat in ancient times? What was their trick? They didn't have banana breeze, FPF, SPF 90, whatever the hell it is. Ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty, right? You think your morning skincare routine requires a lot of work? Think again, Laura. Their routine was written on tomb walls and scrolls. Rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma orizinol was used to block the sun off. Yeah, it was that hard. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. And ancient Greeks as well, they used olive oil as sunscreen as well as ancient Egyptians. Which as far as UV protection goes, it did absolutely nothing. You'd be burnt and extremely dehydrated, but also you'd have some nice tan lines and you wouldn't be as pale as me, so it wasn't all bad. Number eight, the finest of cosmetics. The cosmetics of ancient Egypt were not just for looking good, they were for feeling good too. Like on the inside. Now, as such, those professionals who made the stuff took it pretty seriously. Not just because of a passion for the art, but also because they'd be judged pretty damn harshly if they did a bad job. If they sucked, it would mean having the whole neighborhood give you a bad reputation. And in the cosmetics business, just like show business, it's all about that reputation. It would also mean some harsh judgment from the big boys upstairs meaning the gods when you met the afterlife. So yeah, they wanted to do a good job. And to meet that end, they would try and use the finest of ingredients, 
as they should when people have to put this stuff on their skins and right next to their eyes and stuff. Number seven, deodorant. Before the Old Spice guy was born, what did people even do to smell good? What, I don't, what happened? Deodorant was actually first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s. It was called Mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide. It was stored in a metal container, nothing like speed stick at all. It wasn't discreet or anything. It was bad, but ancient Egyptians, Eh, even worse. They had to use ostrich eggs when it came to smelling good in the pits. They made perfumes as well and were among the first to use any type of deodorant. So that's that's a pretty good start. Thank you. Thank you so much, ancient Egyptians. Hence the ostrich egg factor. They had to start somewhere. They mixed a little fat, tamarisk, tortoise shell, and then nuts, and bam, there you go. You're ready for the day. Just pop it on. Another method was a little more yummy than the ostrich eggs and nuts method. Egyptians would use porridge balls. Yeah, flavored porridge rolled up and securely tucked under your arms. Honestly, that seems like a better alternative. Sometimes when you put antiperspirants or like deodorant on, it gets like all, it all crumbles apart. It's like feta cheese all of a sudden. You're like, what happened to this stick? I want, I would rather have porridge balls than just call it a day, boom. Number six, get this man a Tic Tac or something. Just like I use mints to cure my nasty tea breath, which I argue is worse than coffee breath, the ancient Egyptians used breath mints to keep things fresh. Honestly, they actually sound kind of good. Frankincense, cinnamon, melon, pine seeds and cashews put together, ground up and bound together in candy using honey. <laughs> Just heat that bad boy over the fire and let it cool and boom, breath mints. I like it. I like it a lot. These breath mints would be made commercially by those fine cosmeticians and dentists. Or they could even be made at home. Some archaeological finds of bowls, jars, and other dishes suggest that they may have been candy dishes that would hold the lovely taste in little suckers. Always gotta keep things fun, fresh, and flirty back in ancient Egypt. Breath mints would certainly help you do the trick. <laughs> nice. Number five, loincloths. Going back to ancient Roman and also ancient Egyptian times, the loincloth was used by all. Either that or you would just be naked. I found this neat step-by-step -step online on how to make your own loincloth, because that's apparently what I do on my free time. Thank you for asking. And it's a bit more complicated than I thought. It's way more, it's way more complicated than just throwing on sweatpants or even, you know, the towel fold like a toga. This had numerous steps. We don't have a lot of archaeological evidence because these linens barely made it through a decade, let alone all this time. But ancient Romans would use leather to make underwear. That's a fun little fact right there. Hot goat skin wrapped around your waist in the hot sun. We love it. We still use leather today when it comes to undergarments, but I'll let Adam tell you about that one another time. That's more of a, that's more of a at-home one. Number four, food as medicine. Trying to prevent bad things before they happen, it is a very human skill to have. And when it comes to preventative medicine, the Egyptians had some methods. One more obvious solution is diet. Eating the right stuff truly does help lead to a longer life, but eating the specific right stuff can directly prevent certain issues. As a prime example, the laborers that would build the massive iconic structures we know Egypt for today were kept fed with diets that include a lot of onion, garlic, and radishes. Now, I don't know if the ancient Egyptians knew the chemicals these foods contained, or if they just put two and two together, but onions, garlic, and radishes contain, why did I do this to myself, contain allostatin, allicin, and raffinin which are very helpful when it comes to preventing diseases in the super crowded working and living conditions the laborers existed in. That Allison really helps. Another example would be to cure night blindness. In these circumstances, doctors fed their patients powdered liver, which is rich in vitamin A, which is a vital nutrient for vision. Again, I don't know if they knew it contained that specific fang or if they were just like, hmm, I eat liver and I can see better. Discovery! Number three, acne. Ancient Egyptians came up with an interesting method to getting rid of those pimples. Now, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing, and physicians back then discussed pimples as such. Ready for this? They called them these elevated spots, with black tops that can plague your skin for four to five years. But by squeezing said spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were referred to as maggots. That's what they thought they were back then. Imagine your partner, hey, can you get this pimple on my back? Yeah, I think I got some maggots, thanks. No, no thank you, that's pretty horrible. That's a horrible reference. They would refer to severe cases of acne as maggots that lie in a bed of roses. I would faint, I would be so sick. If a physician told me I had maggots that lie in a bed of roses anywhere on my body, I would throw up, I'd pass out, I'd be so upset. Dermatological disorders were thought to be human skin taking on the properties of animals. Yeah, you have common acne, hmm, maybe you're turning into a pigeon, who knows? 
Ancient Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds, all to get rid of acne. Yeah, sounds like a horrible alternative. I would much rather just have acne. Maggots? Dude, I'm done with this channel. I'm out of here. That's so gross. Number two, eye makeup. Almost everybody and their mums knows that the Egyptians wore that crazy awesome eye makeup. But what you might not know is that it didn't just serve the purpose of making you look absolutely stunning. No, a lot of these eye makeups were lead based. Now, that sounds pretty bad. I can't lie. It does. And it likely was for some. But it was possible that it boosted nitric oxide by up to 240% in cultured human skin cells. I don't know what cultured human skin cells means, but that's the quote. If you know, let me know down below. What the heck does nitric oxide do? Well, that I do know. It helps to boost up your immune system to fight diseases, which, guess what? That's pretty important. Especially in the marshy areas around the Nile, where eye infections are actually pretty darn common. What's cool is that research suggests the Egyptians actually knew that, and specifically synthesized the makeup for this purpose. <laughs> Neat. Finally, number one, mummification. Back in the day, mummification was common, and even today we're finding more mummies. Like, literally last month, we just unraveled six more. It's crazy. We're uncovering more ancient history, which is great, but how exactly was this process done? We're talking about back maggots and stuff. What, what did they think about this? How did this even begin a, to be a thing? Well, it wasn't cheap for starters. Being mummified was reserved for the rich. It's a pretty brutal process as well. What you would do is you would put a hook, or well, they would put a hook in your nose after you'd passed away, and then they would pull out your brain and all that just squishy stuff, just out all through this thing right here. And then they would cut the left side of the stomach open, remove all those goods, all the organs, boom, see ya, gone. And while those are drying, you would put your lungs and liver in jars. And then you would put the heart back in the body. And then you would wash the insides out with wine and spices, all that stuff, turpentine, turpentines, all the time and teens, just all in there washing it out. Then you'd cover the body in salt for 70 days. That's a long time. But around day 40, you would stuff it with sand. Now come day 70, finally, that's when you wrap them in the mummy bandages. Then the sarcophagus awaits forever, really. And there's just jars of organs also stored in your burial chamber. Now it's, we don't do it. It's not as fun anymore. We don't put our organs in jars. We don't stuff anyone with sand. We should. You know what? We should bring I back mummies. Let's just do should. it. I think it's time. Yeah. Number 10, wash your hands. No, seriously, go, go wash your hands right now. When was the last time you washed those filthy nests? Go wash your hands. Washing your hands is super important, especially these days. But something that's very unusual about the Aztecs compared to a lot of other civilizations in history is that, well, they did wash their hands. Oh, and you have no idea how happy that makes me. No more shall I have to think about people shaking hands after using the bathroom with no toilet paper. That's disgusting. Or scooping food onto a plate with their bare, dirty hands and sharing that food with the rest of their families. Yes, the Aztecs like to wash their hands before and after a meal, which is just the way it should be. I hate having grimy hands. You know, I talked to the chief today, and you know what he said? That's it, that's actually it. Yeah, we like that, that's it. Number nine, Aztec Barbershop. It must have been quite the sight for Spanish conquistadors to land upon the shores of North America and then come to bear witness the Aztec civilization in all its glory. Something noticed by the curious Europeans was that the Aztecs had what looked like a barbershop for men. After all, a healthy scalp is a happy one. Even more interesting than that, however, is women were dyeing their hair with a green herb that I'm not even going to begin to pronounce. It was just too hard. It was a lot of X's and T's. I couldn't do it. Which produced a purple shine to their hair. Some women even shaved their hair off, while older women, like mothers, had longer hair. Man, it's almost as if a beautiful civilization was starting to flourish. Well, I'm sure nothing bad ever happens to the Aztecs, right? Number eight. My heroes. Let me create a scenario for you. I like creating scenarios. Let me create a scenario for you. You're on the way to a certain event that is very important in the big city. Maybe it's a new job, a new summer fling, or something that requires dry pants. But now your stomach is acting up. It's big angie. Your stomach's making sounds that are becoming more audible and you can feel soon you will require a bathroom. But you hold it in. I can make it past this event and then go, you say to yourself, no problem. But now you've got cramps, sweats, and you're getting anxious as you know that DEFCON 1 is approaching. You now have to make a decision to make a rush to find a bathroom or be late for your event or take a gamble with your underwear and dignity. 
Yes, that is a feeling I know all too well, but perhaps I should have been living in the Aztec Empire, as they had public washrooms all over the city. That's just awesome. Oh, what sweet relief. As if that weren't the most unusual, they also had citizens cleaning the streets, which is pretty unusual for the time. Yes, cleanliness was very important to the Aztecs, and honestly, I think there should be public toilets on every street corner. Please, sometimes I gotta go. Number seven, thirsty. After a trip to the public washrooms, you may need a drink of water to rehydrate yourself. I mean, come on. I know I could use some hydration after that. Sometimes it gets really sweaty in there. Well, it's a good thing that the Aztec cities had canals. And not just the kind of canals a small Italian gentleman derives a boat through on Valentine's Day, but canals that handled both transportation and irrigation. Aztecs knew just how important water was for life, but perhaps most unusual about the Aztecs is their night soil collectors, which honestly sounds like it's hiding something just in that name. Night soil. Basically, they were beta garbage collectors who used canoes to transport this night soil to farms for fertilizer. And yes, night soil is exactly what you think it is. Poop! But it's unusual for a civilization to be so conscious of where their waste goes. Don't believe me? Well, how about this summer? We all get together, we all go up to New York City and take a dip in the Hudson River. Yeah, not many takers, didn't think so. They were doing their best with what they had. And if women don't find you handsome, they should at least find you handy. You know what I'm saying? Number six, ye olde dentistry. Look, every time I find a decent dentistry fact, I slap that bad boy in here like a D-based infomercial host with a surprisingly effective kitchen gadget. You're gonna love my nuts, remember that guy? This is just one of those facts. Do I have a fear of the dentist? No. No, I don't, because my dentist is nice and has all the modern amenities to make me feel at ease. A comfy chair, laughing gas, and putting Peppa Pig on the TV because I'm a big baby. Goo goo gaga. However, no amount of any of those things I mentioned can prepare you for the dentistry before the year 1900. It was crude to say the least, but hygiene is hygiene and you gotta keep that mouth fresh and clean. Tooth infections were fixed with rubbing charcoal in the affected area, and if that wasn't enough, a super safe mixture of snake venom and vinegar was used. What? I, okay. Who was the first guy that discovered snake venom had such healing properties? Probably the same weirdo who first milked a cow, if I had to guess. Aztec dentistry included fillings and tooth removal as well. Also, ladies of the evening dyed their teeth distinct colors, so then you know if you know. You know? Look at my red teeth, boys. Number five, steam baths. Now looking back and learning that the Aztecs had public washrooms everywhere and had access to steam baths because of their irrigation is fantastic. I mean, come on, just think about it. You could relax after a long day in your own steam bath that's made by natural running water. It sounds like doing yoga there would make me feel more in touch with my inner chakras. And my mood crystals would glow just a little bit brighter. Imagine, you walk into a bathhouse after a long day, and then you see me just sitting there with a towel that barely fits. Well, hey there, good looking. Why don't you come on in and pop a squat next to me? I promise I don't hog all the steam. <laughs> I know it sounds like an amazing time, right? The more we talk about the Aztecs, the more they sound like a perfect society. I wonder what happened to them. I'm sure it was nothing bad. They gotta be out there somewhere. Move over, fellas. I'm coming in for the steam. The steam was thought to have healing properties and was connected to their spirituality. Women even gave birth in the steam rooms, which feels like a really sweaty time. I just, I don't know about that. It's a lot of sweat. Number four, Bath and Body Works. It's clear the Aztecs were just cleaner than the other civilizations of the past, and honestly, I'm here for it. There's only so much a guy can say about people being stinky in the past. I mean, really, the smell must have been horrible, especially down in the nether regions. My lady, I would like to have a child with you, but the fragrance that is coming from both of our undercarriages makes me want to get into my carriage and drive it into the nearest body of water. Yes. Aztecs were making soap like it was their day job, using various herbs and plants to create much nicer smells and perfumes. However, during the rainy months, Aztecs wouldn't wash or wash their clothes in penance. But I guess one month isn't so bad. Strangely enough, women wouldn't wash their faces when men went off to war. I'm not sure about that one, but hey, I'll take it. Gold star for staying clean, Aztecs. Gold star. Number three, Bath and Body Works part two. Okay, another scenario. You're in the sixth grade. You're sitting at a desk and listening to Mrs. Smith, and she's going over what today's art assignment is. As you begin to reach for your favorite shade of red crayon, an odor hits your nose. It's unlike anything you've ever smelled before. And it's coming from your armpit. 
puberty induced body odor. Not to worry, your buddy has a can of the finest spray deodorant there is. He hands you a black can that says Axe. You are now one of them. And you start showing up to school dances with a seafoam pink button up shirt with the collar popped and a Justin Bieber haircut with the hat on backwards. Yeah, that's right. All while drenched in a can of Axe's finest. Shark tooth necklace shows every girl in the room that you're a tough guy. God, those guys are the worst. Okay, no, the Aztecs didn't go that far, but they were aware of the horrors of the classroom BO and recommended a special bath prepared with lovely smelling aromas, which makes sense. Good smells go in, bad smells from your bum, they go out. However, there's two ingredients that make me question things. Apparently, no odor killing bath is complete without a fresh bone from a dog and a human. I'm just gonna leave that with you and think about how you'd feel with two bones floating in your bath. That's disgusting. Apparently, they had to be fresh too. That's gross. Number two, the Aztec classic. I'm glad the Aztecs had better hygiene because for once, I don't get super queasy talking about the things people did. However, it wouldn't be a video about Aztecs if I didn't talk about their favorite pastime. Sacrifice. And honey, if they were giving out gold medals for it, the Aztecs would be record breakers. Sure, they weren't the only civilization to sacrifice people, but they did it with such theatrics. It would make my old theater teacher very proud. But unlike most civilizations, the Aztecs did this all the time. Whenever the calendar called for one, it was time for one. And if they ran out of people, they would go grocery shopping for more. Or actually just go to war and take people, which is not good. Just know that when a chief or a religious leader cuts the heart out of a man whilst alive for the entire city to see, he most likely had a clean cloth and water to wash his hands, making modern surgeons proud everywhere. Number one, the European bug. It's safe to say that Aztecs, while not as clean as people today, they were striving for better hygiene, more than any other civilization at the time, really. However, no amount of hand washing, sacrificing, or putting herbs in your bath can prepare them for the Spanish. Not just the swords and the guns and invading and such, no, I mean the sickness that Europeans brought with them. It's a plot similar to War of the Worlds, except the invaders brought all the nasties with them. No matter what the Aztecs did, it wasn't going to stop the waves of lovely things the Europeans brought over. Armpits are clean, but now they got black lungs. There's too many diseases to even name, there's a lot.